Hi everyone, I am Thomas Ogo Ramsay. I am the CEO and founder of Neurons Inc., the consumer neuroscience company. We're based out of Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, but we are also present in the US, Latin America, including Brazil, in Asia, and so forth. So uh, today I will tap into some of the background I have within uh, consumer neuroscience and neuromarketing. I've been working many years uh, also beyond that in terms of uh, psychology, neuropsychology, neuroscience, and also behavioral sciences as well. And what I will try to talk about is the future of neuromarketing. And um, in order for us to be able to talk about the future of neuromarketing, we also have to look at the past and also the present, because there are so many things happening these days in terms of how, um, you know, both technological uh, developments, uh, scientific advances as well. So there are so many things that we need to tap into what's happened until now and what's happening these days in order to understand the future. So let's get started with that. If we ask ourselves what neuromarketing is, uh, we can say that neuromarketing is the use of uh, neuroscience tools and insights to better measure, understand, and influence consumer engagement and choice. So the focus here is on um, the use of tools, the use of insights, and how we can combine the two in order to understand consumers and whether that can be used in some way to improve the way that consumers are responding to brands, for example. And uh, as we'll see, we need to distinguish between neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience on this. One of the things that we've seen when it comes to neuromarketing is that it started as a mix between commercial and academic insights. So on one side, we had cognitive neuroscience, neuroscience, neuropsychology, being merged and combined with marketing and consumer insights and consumer psychology to try to understand how consumers made up their minds. And what we saw there was a lot of uh, industrial and commercial interest. And uh, that was coined at the time by Arlen Schmitz uh, as neuromarketing. And that is now what we see as the mostly kind of commercial enterprise, if you like. As a, as a counterpart to that, we saw that consumer neuroscience was a, a, an invention, so to speak, or a term that academics wanted to impose uh, to this industry because they didn't think of neuromarketing as the commercial enterprise, but they used uh, co consumer uh, behaviors and also neuroscience to understand how we make decisions. So that's more like an academic and theoretical approach that they were focusing on. So that's why we can think of neuromarketing as the commercial use of neuroscience tools and insights, while the consumer neuroscience approach is more the academic enterprise of understanding consumers' decisions and just decision-making in general. As you can see here on uh, the slide, there's a, an EEG uh, on the top. So this is a lightweight EEG system, which is electrodes that you put on the scalp of the head that are picking up on the electrical discharges from inside the brain that goes through the scalp, so to speak. And what you typically do then is to uh, use those signals and you, you treat and, and prepare those data and you clean the data. And then you can look into things such as the frequency band analysis to look at you know, how different frequencies um, you know, from the brain are responding to certain stimuli, for example. And then by the growth in our knowledge in how the brain works, uh, we can be better at understanding that certain types of frequency combinations are from emotional responses, others are from, you know, uh, awake or sleep, others again are for cognitive processes and so forth. At the bottom here you see eye tracking. Uh, these are the latest eye tracking glasses from Toby and you can see they look very much like, you know, some kind of modern uh, glass and they have sensors then, you know, a lot of inf infrared sensors that are measuring on the pupils or the eyes, and you need to do the infrared in order to capture the eye properly. Um, there are other types of uh, eye tracking devices as well. That you know, for example, the static or you know, the the um, the, uh, the static ones uh, uh, fixed under a screen, for example. Uh, there are now uh, attempts to do this with a web uh, webcam eye tracking and other methods, but uh, a lot of them are still need to do um, you know a lot of validation to be able to to be used. One of the really critical first studies that we saw was a study by Brian Knudsen from Stanford University. And one of the things that uh, he and his group were studying was consumer decisions in an fMRI scanning paradigm. What that means is that he had people, uh, gave people money before they went into the scanner. 
He then asked people to make different types of decisions while they were in the scanner. They could use their own money during that task. And as we can see in this figure, on the left side, on the top side, we can see that first people saw a product for four seconds. So that could be a chocolate, it could be a piece of music, it could be other things that they could purchase um, for the money. The second point was a that they were given a prize for this product. And that prize was typically yeah, within the normal range, but they also had some what we call catch uh, trials where they also showed that uh, you know the price was too high for example to see how people responded to that and finally uh, for four seconds they were given a choice and uh, so basically do you want to buy this product for this price and then you could say yes or no yes i want to buy this product for my money that i just got from you and of course they got more money than a single product so they can purchase could purchase many products as such and there was a fixation cross in between trials, and they did this several, several times. When the researchers asked uh, the participants of the study, how or when do you feel that you're making up your mind? When do you feel that you make your decisions? People typically said something like, uh, well, I look at the product, I look at the price, I weigh pro and con, and then I feel that's when I make my decision, and I press the button. So it's kind of the, the last four seconds, the choice phase, if you like that. That was when the uh, participants felt that that was when they made up their minds and they acted on that. Now, Knudsen and his colleagues looked into the brain responses that people had during the two previous phases. So both the price phase, but also the product viewing phase. So remember that people don't feel that they're making decision at this point. But what the research were able to find was that during the product viewing find, uh, phase, the four seconds that they spent looking at the product only, so passive viewing, if you like, Knudsen and colleagues, they found that it's a particular part of the brain that responds the more uh, they want to buy this product. So a deep structure of the brain, as you can see on the bottom part here, this is kind of a transsectional slice. So imagine I'm sitting here and you could slice off here and look in into uh, my, my brain here. There will be some deep structures and it's the same structure just in the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. It's called a nucleus accumbens and, or ventral striatum. So it's, it's down at the bottom of this striatal uh, part, which is a deep structure of the brain. Higher activity in this part of the brain when they were watching the product was associated with higher purchasing uh, at the end. And remember that this is four, eight, 12 seconds, eight to 12 seconds before people feel that they make up their minds, we can already see that there's a decision going on in the brain at this time. So that was a critical moment in the 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 renewal, so to speak, the, the, um, the academization and the validation of consumer neuroscience and neuromarketing because there is something that it goes on in people's minds that is actually preceding what people are choosing and what they're thinking and what they're experiencing as their choice. So it's still the person that's making the choice, but you can say to that, you know, many of our decisions are actually taken before we are consciously aware of them. So that's a critical study when it comes to this. And there are other studies that follow this and uh, that show that there are other types of decision going on under you know, unconsciously, so to speak. The Knutson study is, to me, one of the, the most famous um, and most important neuromarketing studies that we've seen from the beginning, at least. There are other studies, such as the McClure study, that uh, studied the use of Pepsi versus Coca-Cola and how that changed the activity in the brain. Uh, it has been explained so many times now. I think the Knutson study is actually the one that we should look a little bit into as well, because it's more about decision making also, not just how people experience something. And uh, in, in a paper that I did uh, several years ago with Hilke Plasman and Mili Milosevljevic, uh, we, a part of that paper was to take a broad, broad view of what other studies like Knutson studies uh, have shown uh, when it comes to different types of consumers' behaviors. As you can see in the figure here, we found that there are certain parts of the brain that are involved in different types of brand-related activity. So that will be, you know, the types of brand associations that people have were associated with diff different types of activity in their striatum, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the paracingulate cortex, anterior cingulate. All these are very fancy names, but these are just names of different structures or regions in the brain. 
uh, if you look at the favor favorability, so whether people have positive brand associations, we saw that the, that was associated with stronger activity in the insula, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the parasingular cortex, the anterior cingulate, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and the parietal cortex. So it's a whole network that you know positive associations to brands uh, lead to. So it's not a single structure in the brain. It's more like a network code, if you like. If you look to, to the bottom left, uh, when we look at brand memory and brand knowledge, so this is basically how well do you know Coca-Cola and also what associations do you have to Coca-Cola? So how well do you know it? Uh, and also uh, what is your memory of a brand? We saw that the hippocampus, which is a memory structure, was more engaged and more involved when people had brand memories. And also the surrounding parahippocampal area, for example, and also parasynclet and dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And that also means that when people have associations for a brand, it kind of activates and reactivates, uh, um, uh, you could say, memory structures or memory uh, networks of the brain. And finally, one of the interesting things I, I think is uh, is what we found what is that brand loyalty was associated with stronger activity in the striatum. And if you remember the Knutson study, we talked about the nucleus accumbens or the ventral striatum, the bottom part of the striatum, being involved in this uh, automatic or unconscious decision making. So what we see here is that this part of the brain seems to be very much involved in loyalty. It's a brand loyalty, which means that the the likelihood that you will keep on buying the same uh, product, for example. And the interesting thing here, when it comes to this part of the brain, this striatum, is that this part of the brain is actually not under conscious control. It's not part of your conscious brain. It basically makes decisions on its own without you consciously interfering with it. And this suggests that brand loyalty might really not be a conscious thing. It, it's more like an unconscious, almost like a habit. Because what we see with this part of the brain as well, the striatum, is that this part of the brain is very much involved in habitual behaviors. So when you have habits, this part of the brain is also engaged. So at least part of a loyalty for from a consumer perspective is driven by habit, which is kind of interesting. I don't think a lot of people have looked into this yet, but this is one of the things that could be interesting for you know pursuing a bit more. So already here, you can see that consumer neuroscience and neuromarketing makes us think differently about how consumer behaviors work. So already now, brand loyalty, which in many ways is understood as a conscious, deliberate act that we keep on choosing the same brand or product because we like it, because we think it's good and we have good experiences with it. This part of the study suggests that it's a more unconscious process. And that leads us to, you know, a better insight, a more nuanced insight, but it might also give us uh, some ideas to how we can uh, boost brand loyalty, for example. We'll get back to that. To make a very simplistic model, uh, I think a lot of people talk about uh, you know the brain being divided in three: the triune brain, the the uh, uh, the uh, the uh, mammalian brain, the reptile brain, things like that. To be honest, uh, we have to debunk that. It's been debunked for more than a decade, so it's time that we move on. But to make, still make a very simplistic picture here. What we can see when it comes to the cortex here is that that is related to controlled action, to planning, to initiative, to impulse control, working memory, hedonic experience, so your experience of something positive and negative. And it requires mobilization. It requires you to mobilize your, your energy, your mental energy, so to speak, to focus on something, to choose something, to pursue something, right? On the other side, the basal ganglia, which is these deep structures like the striatum, for example, these are related to constantly monitoring the environment unconsciously. So they lead to direct responses, such as jumping in the chair when you're scared, watching a horror movie. It's a uh, it's non-conscious. It's uh, related to habits, so you know automatic behaviors. It's related to needs and desires. And it's also automatic. So you can see this, this distinction. And in many ways, you can think of uh, this as, as a distinction that we see in behavioral, uh, behavioral science as well. We talk about system one, system two. It overlaps a little bit with it, but the basal ganglia will typically be like system one, while the, the cortex will be system two in a very simplistic um, uh, approach. But this also means that when we are trying to ask questions about how we make decisions. So let's say we want to understand consumers. What this entails is that we are typically talking to the language processing conscious cortex, if you like. But what we don't get 
is that the basal ganglia, the deep structures of the brain, we can't uh, talk to that structure because it's not under conscious control. So that means that there's a lot of consumer behaviors that we cannot capture with you know, uh, in general, with with uh, surveys and interviews and focus groups. So that's been a long standing. We need to understand both. So in a research environment, you should do both the unconscious and the the, uh, the conscious. You need to tap into both and have data on both. But uh, you know, in terms of understanding consumer behaviors, it's very often that we see that the basal ganglia, the deep structures of the brain, are more active uh, when we make decisions and typically driving the decisions. Okay, so if we have this two-step uh, model, the cortex and the subcortex, or the, the basal ganglia, for example, now let's look at how this can manifest in different types of consumer behaviors, your own behaviors. For us to understand different types of consumer behaviors, I just um, need to, to distinguish here a little bit between different types of choices, just to highlight the difference between the cortex and the basal ganglia. On the one side, uh, imagine that you wake up in the morning and you desperately want a cigarette or a cup of coffee. You, that's the first thing you think about almost. Or your smartphone. Uh, it's shown that you know the vast majority of people that wake up in the morning, they're starting to check their phone. Why is that happening? Is that a conscious choice or is it more like a, an unconscious choice? And it seems that a lot of the way it is an, a, an, an unconscious choice. And this means that there's this battle, if you like, between the unconscious and the conscious. The conscious typically being more rational, more um, sane, if you like, while the unconscious is just habit-driven. It just wants to do stuff. It thinks about it and it just shoots, it starts behaving. And that's why sometimes you take a cigarette or a caf uh, caffeine or you eat chocolate more than you want to. Uh, so consciously you, you could say to yourself, okay, I, I want to stop using this um, uh, phones late in the evening or early in the morning. I want to stop smoking. I don't need uh, four cups of coffee. I don't want to have that before I wake up. Uh, and I don't want to eat too much chocolate, for example. But these things lead to a battle in your own mind. And that's interesting with constant consumer behavior, because when we talk to people and we say, what do you, would you, do you think you would do in the future? We tend to have a very positive view of uh, our future behaviors. We tend to say, okay, I will eat less chocolate. I will stop smoking and I would, leave, uh, I would drink less coffee and I will also use uh, the digital devices much less in the future. But what it turns out is that if we could talk to the subconscious, the deep structures of the brain, the picture would look very differently. And that's why it's so difficult to break habits, because we can always talk to ourselves, we can be conscious about it, but when it turns out to change behavior, uh, we cannot just rely on the unconscious deep structures of the brain to follow suit, to understand what we consciously want to do. They have a different agenda for themselves. Now, one of the things that we have seen when it comes to uh, consumer neuroscience studies and your marketing studies is that uh, along the way, a lot of the way, um, they have been focusing on stu studying uh, brain responses in a highly in artificial environment. So that means using an MR scanning to do functional magnetic resonance imaging. That method is a very good measure of understanding different parts of the brain, which parts of the brain are more engaged when you're doing certain tasks. Um, but it's, as you can see here, it's a huge scanner. So, so first of all, it's impossible for a lot of people to do this type of research. The second problem is that uh, we see that it's uh, very expensive. So that's the other thing. And, and actually even more problematic is that having people lie down in the scanner performing tasks in a highly artificial environment also leads to different types of behaviors. People don't behave in the same way as they do inside a brain scanner as they do outside in the store environment, for example. So using an fMRI, which is very expensive and also leads to you know, non-normal behaviors, might not be the optimal choice. And that's why we think that um, one way to, to, to do studies when it comes to uh, neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience is also to study brain responses in normal, more normal environments. So what we want to do is to increase what we call the ecological validity. So what that means is that when we do a study, we want to be able to claim that the responses people have is very comparable to what they do in everyday life. So using these types of scanners, we need to have a different, um, a different type of brain meshes and other types of meshes. So what have we done instead? Instead, uh, what we are using is what we call an EEG brain scanner, and we're using eye tracking. That is becoming more and more the standard way of doing uh, neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience studies, because 
Uh, one of the things is that going beyond fMRI scannings, for example, EEG is actually one of the really oldest ways of measuring brain responses. So we've been doing this for decades and decades and decades, and we have become much better at actually doing this type of study. One of the things that we have also had as a challenge is that um, we've had to have a lot, of, a lot of shielding because the EEG is measuring on the electrical output from the brain. And what that leads to is a lot of, you know, it also highly sensitive, uh, you know, it's also highly sensitive to other types of electrical noises. So if you clench your jaw, if you start chewing, for example, it leads to noise. If you start moving too much, it leads to noise. If you're very close to electrical outlets, it can p be picked up as a noise in your signal as well. But over time, over the decades, we have become much better at actually reducing the noise, so to speak, or overcoming the noise challenges. And the last big change has been that uh, EEG can now become mobile. So that means that we can have an equipment on the EEG, it can be put in basically in your bag or you know, something like that in your pocket, and you can actually walk into a store environment, you can sit in your own home, you can be tested in a chair, for example, you don't need to sit in front of a computer, for example. And this allows us to study behaviors in a much better way than we've ever been before. And that means that this is kind of the, what we see when technology becomes better, it means that it becomes better at, uh, on the one side, it becomes smaller, it becomes more affordable, it becomes more available. Science then also allows us to, on the one side, uh, be better at denoising the signal. It's also making us better at understanding the signals from the brain. So all in all, these things are leading to devices that are much more affordable, they are smaller, less intrusive, they are more reliable, and we are better at denoising de de the signal, and we're also better at understanding the signal, the output that we, yeah, that, we, that we have from the EEG. On top of that, we are also using eye tracking, and eye tracking allows us to measure eye movements. And what that does is, of course, that we can quantify exactly where people are paying attention, what they're missing, and also how much time they're spending on different items as they walk through a store environment, for example. And the com combination of eye tracking and EEG here is that we can combine them in the way that both looking at what people are looking at and how they respond, but also to how they respond to different items. So imagine that you have three products on a shelf. One product, when people look at that, you can extract the EEG data from that, as opposed to product two and product three. And what that allows you then to do is to compare how people respond emotionally, for example. My own background is, uh, you know, first of all, doing neuropsychology, which is uh, studying patients with uh, brain uh, injuries and brain disorders and diseases. But I also did a PhD where I used fMRI and structural MRI, as we see uh, in, so in this picture here. Uh, and this is kind of a huge machine. And I, I, I learned how to do the scanning from A to Z, uh, both in terms of setting up the study, uh, programming, which sequences and uh, recordings we were going to do, uh, scanning every single subject in my PhD, analyzing each of the data, uh, publicizing the, the results, for example. So that is a very tedious and very important process you need to know exactly how to do. It's actually not very different when you do an EEG recording. It is a different device. There are different types of data. You look at it differently. But the whole process of knowing how to set up the study, knowing how to uh, analyze the data, to and also before that even, to prepare the data and clean the data, data handling and so forth. And then and when you get the results, how to analyze the results, how to interpret the results, and then come up with the recommendations to clients, for example, or if you're doing a publication, what that means in, in the bigger picture. This, this is very important that you know exactly how to do this. And that's why it's so important when you have neuroscience uh, companies, they need to have statisticians on board, they need to have engineers on board, they need to have business people on board, and they also need to have neuroscientists on board. And and, and it's still a lot of time before you can actually just plug and play those devices. And, and I think it's important for, for everyone to realize, both the vendors and the clients and the buyers of this, is that there's no such thing as a, as a plug and play for neuroscience technology. You definitely need to have a team on board that knows exactly how this works, how to use the data and how to run the analyses. So. And one of the things that is important when it comes to using those data is also to have a conceptual model of how can you understand uh, the responses that people have. How can we conceptualize that in terms of understanding different types of consumer responses? And how can we quantify it to be able to uh, get better insights to why people respond the way they do, 
where does something uh, seems to work seem to work or not? So, in this uh, in this model is something that we have developed together with Stanford University, uh, Professor Baba Shiv at uh, at Stanford, and uh, it's a four power model. And the four powers basically means in terms of you know, what we originally um, developed this for was to look at different types of responses to advertising, but it goes way beyond that. Advertising is just one type of response that we look at. We can also look at packaging, we can look at retail environments, we can look at architecture, we can look at innovation and so forth. So all of this can uh, is something we can apply, uh, employ this, this uh, four power model to. Now let's take each of the powers in turn. Stopping power, that is the, the, the you know, basically visual attention or attention in general. What is the likelihood that something is grabbing attention, that it will sustain attention, or that you will also look for something? So attention is just not a single thing. Attention can be driven by a lot of things. It can be automatic, it can be will-induced, so what we call top-down attention, but it could also be driven by emotional responses. So if you are scared about something, you tend to look at it more, for example. Now, the way that we're measuring uh, attention is at least in a couple of ways. So Eye tracking is the first thing. Uh, we are quantifying visual attention by eye tracking glasses or, you know, bars underneath a a a a, um, a screen, for example. Uh, one of the things that we've seen recently is that people start using webcams for eye tracking measurements. Uh, we have been trying to do that. I, I don't think the data or the methods are still reliable enough. Uh, we seem to have a lot of noise in these recordings, so we are still not using webcam for eye tracking because it's too noisy and it's and, and it's uh, you might get the wrong uh, results and conclusions based on that uh, in my experience uh, we also have neurovision which is more like a prediction of where people will look and i'll get back to that as a method as well when it comes to persuasion power so imagine that now you have people's attention but what is uh, what are their emotional responses how do people respond emotionally to whatever you are presenting with them uh, how do they have a positive emotional response do they have a negative emotional response and then all they have, do they have a, like a passive ne neutral response this is something you need to have either a brain scanning t technology or a physiological measure to be able to measure. So you can imagine that you um, you can imagine that you can measure things like um, sweating in the palm of the hand. You can measure facial responses or facial expressions, for example. My problem with those two methods is that uh, the sweat in the palm of the hand is also a very noisy signal. Uh, it can be really hard to. Uh, to actually know exactly how people respond and it's it's a sluggish slow response so it's sometimes hard to distinguish between you know what did people respond to here was it this event or this event especially if you have events that happen very shortly after, after each other uh, facial expressions is a very popular measure my concern with facial ex expression uh, mapping is that it's also pretty unreliable uh, and also from just a purely theoretical per perspective what we know in psychology and the psychology of, of emotions is that emotional expressions like facial expressions we, we don't tend to have you know very clear emotional responses like smiling all the time or being uh, sad all the time for example and the expressions are also very uh, very muffled, so to speak. So having automatic tracking of facial expressions is interesting, but I wouldn't bet my business on doing facial coding at this point because it's simply too unreliable. And it's very individual how people respond emotionally with their facial expressions. A lot of, of these issues with that, so we don't do it. Now, uh, the other types of responses that we look at is, you know, we can look at uh, emotional responses through EEG. And if you do the type of measurements uh, and you do the science correctly, you can track emotional, res uh, emotional responses down to a few tens to hundreds of milliseconds. So like uh, 10 to 50 times per second, you can have an emotional reading, if you like. So that means that you can track emotional responses over time, especially two different dimensions. Arousal, which is the intensity of the emotion, and what we call motivation, which is whether people have an approach or avoidance behavior. And what that leads to is then you can you can measure both whether people are uh, interested or disinterested in something, whether they are attracted to something, but also the intensity of that emotion. If you do things like pupil dilation, sweating in the palm of your hand, the galvanic skin response, for example, uh, heart rate and things like that, uh, you can only measure one dimension, which is uh, arousal. So that is one of the limitations when you use 
other met methods than EEG, for example. Now, the third power is called transmission power. And transmission is all about whether you can convey the message, convey the actual message that you want to, to in your ad, for example. And that could be, do people uh, understand what you're trying to tell? Uh, will they understand it? Is it too much information? Is it too little information? And so forth. Because that will go over to be a, a memory and a, a comprehension of the messaging that you have. This also applies to non-advertising as well, such as, um, you know, do people understand your new ad? Or how do people respond to virtual reality uh, apps, for example? Are they overloaded with the information? Is the learning curve too high, for example? And here you, this is more or less only brain scanning you can do. There are some physiological measures you can do, but they're very gross and very, uh, very uh, you know, muffled, so to speak, as well. So if you do EG and do it properly, you can track people's what we call working memory or cognitive load, which is the amount of information that people process at any one time. If that goes too high, people feel that they're overloaded with information. If it goes too low, they're basically tuning out. So here you have a different measure of cognitive processing, if you like, information processing. And finally, we have locking power, which is more or less kind of memory. So do people remember the ad? Do they remember the brand that it was for? Uh, if you have them go through a movie or they are trying a new experience in the store, for example, what are the things that they remember? You can do, do this both as the kind of what people uh, remember as a strength of the memory, uh, the strength of the brand memory, for example. But you can also measure the um, the associations that people have. And when it comes to associations, these would be, you know, if you if I say Coca-Cola to you, what are the immediate things you'd come to think about? Well, you might think about the bottle, the brand, the red. You might even think about Santa Claus, for example. Um, so there are things that are associated with your brand, with the brand that is critical to understand. And even here, you can use both explicit, so stated or conscious responses, but you can also use implicit responses. And implicit responses are then uh, things that you can use what's called an implicit association test to measure people's you know, unconscious associations to your brand, for example. So here you have four different powers, stopping power, persuasion power, transmission power, and locking power. And this is a very powerful tool that you can use uh, both as a conceptual model to see what do we need to do to grab people's attention? Or once we have people's attention, how can we make sure that we are emotionally engaging them? Or when we have their attention, how can we make sure that people don't freak out with too much information, that they actually understand what we say? And then finally, locking power is also about how can we make sure that people remember us? And the locking power, I have to add at the end here as well, is that even habits is a way of having a locking power. That's a very unconscious uh, locking power, if you like. So learning how to use an app, for example. So the first time you use the app, you don't have a habit for uh, habit for it. But as you've used it a hundred times, you get a very good habit of you know automatic behaviors, so to speak. And as you can see, as I talked about this through this as well, you have uh, for each of those powers, we have measures we can use. So both it's a theoretical and conceptual model. It's a measurement in a toolbox. And it's also things that we can start fiddling around with to improve the performance of our brand, our product, our experience. Now, to give you one example of uh, attention, uh, this is a study we did for the Mobile Marketing Association in conjunction with a lot of these uh, large uh, online uh, behemoths, if you like, the large um, corporations like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, uh, ESPN, and Yahoo News. And the, the, the issue here from the industry, from the perspective of social media, for example, we know that um, there's a three-second rule. There has been a three-second rule for many, many years that the assumption being that you have to have your ad being shown for at least three seconds in order for it to be processed one way or the other. Now, the question is that, is that true? Uh, because it's been an assumption that has been uh, challenged uh, for a long time. And what from a kind of a, a psychological perspective and consumer psychology perspective, and uh, even from the, even the, the beginning of psychology, like 120 years ago, we know that people tend to process information much faster than three seconds. We need just a fraction of a second in order to process information that is shown to us. 
So from that perspective, we would expect that if we show things quickly, we can still show that uh, there's an attentional response, there's an emotional response, and there's even a cognitive response. And what we did was then to have uh, ads presented on different uh, on the different social media feeds, and we had uh, in people's own social media feeds basically. And what we did was then to insert ads and control both on the one side uh, how long people were exposed to the ad. So that is a, you know, they couldn't scroll themselves. So that was in order to have full control. But we also had uh, other tasks where people can scroll their own feed and then we could sample, first of all, how long was the ad in the screen and also uh, what the, were their responses. And using both eye tracking and EEG, we found that already at 400 milliseconds, that's less than half a, of a second, we saw that 67% uh, of the ads uh, were seen. So that means that they had a minimum of six, uh, uh, three fixations of 20 milliseconds each, which is what you know typically we call a, 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 a an attention fixation, if you like. What this means is that people were processing information already at 400 milliseconds. There's some impression, so to speak, of the ad on people's brains. At 700 milliseconds, we saw that 10% of the ads created an emotional response. So already you know, slightly over half a second, you know, way before three seconds, but also even before one second, we saw that people started to have emotional responses to an ad. And finally, around one second, uh, more than 50% of the ads created a memory response. So that means that even one second of, of exposure could lead to people having a memory response afterwards, long afterwards, so actually several you know, tens of minutes afterwards. So this suggests that what happens in the first second is actually critical for an advertising perspective. And this is leading to you know, what we call the one second strategy hashtag. And this is changing the industry to focusing more on how can you make sure that the ad is seen for uh, at least one second, that's one thing, but also what are you spending the first second on, so to speak? How can you make sure that people see your brand, they see your key message, and they remember it within the first second? Because people, they're not really interested in watching ads, so they will scroll past your ad. So you basically have one second to, to actually make an impression. The problem is that in the industry, we see that a lot of people are spending, well, I can say a lot of time putting long narratives of videos on social media and where the brand typically comes halfway through or very much at the end. So you can imagine that when that happens, uh, the expectation is that people will watch the ad until the end. And very often they don't do that. So of course, that part of the MMA study was all about how you can use um, this eye tracking and EG equipment to measure how people respond and when they respond. But now the question is also at the end of this, how, how long does it actually take for people to, you know, to process an ad and how long are people staying with the ad? We also looked into that. One of the other findings we had was that the average ad exposure, so the length of people that people watch an ad was 3.4 seconds, three and a half seconds. That's on average, how much time people spend on the ad. So the old idea that you need at least three seconds for, to make an impression is not true at all. It means that you have at maximum three and a half seconds on average to make your impression. So going from this three second cutoff, uh, you should think of what should you spend the first second on and how can you make sure that people that are watching your ad for three and a half seconds, what are the things you show there? And it seems horrible to be making an ad for three and a half seconds. But what we see is that there are certain things that work better than others and there are some platform differences, but uh, it's still early days to come up with some really sharp uh, recommendations at this point. And I think that at this point, this realization means that the industry is now really understanding that for them and for you to make better advertising on these platforms, you need to focus on the first three, three and a half seconds at, at max. But also in addition to that, you need to find out ways to keep people engaged even more. Now, one of the things that, of course, we um, we should talk about is how we can do neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience beyond ad testing. And ad testing is, of course, one of the, the key things when we talk about neuromarketing. Everyone is focusing on how you can do advertising and how you can uh, provide your brand or your call to action, for example. But looking beyond that, this is also a, a place where neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience is making its strengths. And I'll give you uh, a couple of, of uh, cases that we've had with some of our uh, uh, clients um, in in the US, for example. So in this slide, uh, I'm showing uh, a study we did 
some time ago for Lowe's. And Lowe's, if you don't know Lowe's, it's one of the biggest companies in the US. It's a Fortune 40 company. And it, uh, it is a, a home improvement co uh, company. So that means that if you want to fix your house, uh, work in your house, you go to Lowe's to buy equipment and stuff and you know tools. And then you go and you do, your, uh, do it yourself uh, back at home. Uh, it's also for prof professionals, of course. Um, now, one of the things that Lowe's were interested in uh, was to test to what extent being exposed to an ad uh, would change in-store behaviors. So the question that we always ask is, you know, sure, we, we're showing an ad, but does it actually change people's behaviors inside the store environment? In this study, uh, we had three groups. One group, uh, so all of the groups actually were um, calibrated. They were set up in the store environment or in a separate room before going into the store. And a part of that calibration procedure were, was to sh uh, be looking at different advertisements. And looking at those ads, um, the, the, uh, we, did, the, the, uh, we distinguished between three different groups. One group were just looking at different ads. Another group was seeing a, um, also an ad for a very particular paint brand. It's called Valspar. And another group saw a longer version of that uh, that ad. Now, just to make it simple for this study, let's focus on comparing the control group that didn't see the Valspar ad and the test group that saw the Valspar ad, the paint ad. Did they actually behave differently? First of all, what we saw before looking at those uh, these graphs here was that when people purchased, one of the tasks that they had inside the store environments, and they were also recruited for uh, you know home improvement, including painting their own house or you know painting the, the living room of the house or something like that. When they got to the paint uh, paint ad section of the store, we saw that those who were um, exposed to the ad, the Valspar ad, were much more likely to um, to to uh, buy uh, Valspar. And when they got to the checkout and we asked them questions afterwards, they came up with a very good story about, oh, I chose this brand because I like it more or uh, the colors reminded me of something from my childhood or you know, things like that. So th when we asked them and said, you know, do you remember seeing an ad for this before we went into, into the, the store? And some people said, yes, they remember that, uh, actually most of them. But even though they remembered it, uh, they said, no, I wasn't affected by the ad. I just, this is my choice, right? So consciously, there's, a, there's this element of, um, you know, we make a decision uh, that we are not consciously aware of. And when we then looked at the eye tracking data, we saw that, as you can see on the left side here, we saw that when people got to the paint shelf, the control group and the test group behave very differently, especially if you look at the middle section here. That is when we had the branded paint shelf. So you can see the the, um, the control group only looked at the Valspar, this part of the ad, very just briefly, a small section. But the test group who were exposed to the ad had a strong uh, response. Uh, they looked very much to kind of explore the shelf much more than the control group. So that's interesting. We also saw that when we measure, measured on emotional responses, especially the uh, motivation response, so one of the emotional responses that you can measure using EEG, we saw that the control group responded just you know, slightly neutral when they were watching and looking at the Valspar products. But we saw that the group that was exposed to the ads uh, had a you know, much higher emotional response to the those products, the branded products. So. This is a very clear demonstration and it's actually currently being in review for a scientific publication. And it's also been uh, shown at uh, scientific conferences as well. This is a very clear demonstration, the added value of doing neuroscience testing in you know, both advertising, but also in store environment, for example. We can have a much better understanding of you know, the different powers, if you like. The, it, it, here is the stopping power and the persuasion power, how they can lead to changes in behavior without people actually knowing. And you can imagine that if you only had survey responses here, just asking people questions, you know, walk-alongs or surveys or interviews, they would not be able to tell you this. So that is the added value of neuroscience right there. And the innovation part here is that this is now moving into the store environment. We don't need a fixed lab environment to be able to do this type of test. Actually, due to the innovation in terms of technology, they're becoming smaller, cheaper, 
and also the science becoming much better at denoising the signal, as I mentioned before, we can now move into the store environment if you do the science correctly. It's not just straightforward. You just cannot just smack on this equipment, just go into the store. You need to have people uh, that know exactly how to denoise the signal. Lowe's is one of the companies that we have worked uh, with the longest. Uh, so when the company was started in 2013, Lowe's was actually the company that brought us into you know, existence more or less. And we worked very closely with the Lowe's Innovation Labs. And that also means that, you know, uh, Neurons, my company, and a lot of the other companies that are doing neuroscience are also very closely tied to innovation work. And what we have seen is that when we really need to understand customer sentiments, when we need to understand and predict their behaviors, and also diagnose what is going wrong uh, with, you know, uh, we know that, for example, 75% of all uh, product launches into the market are failing after just one to two years, which suggests that we need to be better at actually producing a product that people uh, like and understand when and where it goes wrong. And that's why neuroscience has been extremely helpful in both predicting what people, you know, when people get a concept or a prototype, but also to diagnose what goes wrong and how, how we can improve that. In another study for Facebook, we looked into how people responded to being uh, in a virtual reality environment and doing social interaction. Um, this was at the time that Facebook had just acquired Oculus, so they were very interested in trying to understand better how to integrate the, the Oculus and the virtual environment into the whole idea of you know, bringing people together, as, which is you know, Facebook's uh, approach. And what they found, and what we found in this study, was that uh, you know, it, it, it is a very strong uh, emotional response to people to have this, and people do feel connected when they are in a virtual environment. So what we had in the study was to, uh, you know, people wore Oculus Rift, uh, so this was before Oculus Quest, um, and we gave them a task of uh, of being together with other people they have not, had not meet, met before. We also compared this to people who were, uh, you know, meeting in person as well. So we had both uh, in terms of men and women, and also in terms of whether people met in person or whether they met in a virtual environment. And what we found was that overall, women tended to have a stronger emotional response to both uh, in person and to VR, but it was highly comparable. Uh, you know, the virtual reality and the in person responses were very comparable. And this means that the emotional responses we tend to have in a virtual environment tend to be natural or very close to natural. And this is in contrast to other types of modes of connection, such as, as we see here on, uh, in, you know, these days in on Zoom and Hangouts, for example, people don't have the same type of emotional connection that they do in real life. So it means that, you know, if you have, um, if you have a virtual, uh, if you have reality and, you know, just meeting a person in reality, and then you have emotional responses to, uh, being on Hangouts or Zoom, for example, it's actually lower. But then virtual reality is very close to being normal. Uh, so that, that is a good indication in itself. The other th thing we also found was that introverts tended to have a stronger emotional connection in virtual environments than extroverts. So extroverts tended to still prefer and have a more positive e experience for in-person meetings, while introverts tended to have a much stronger emotional response to uh, in a virtual environment. So that's an interesting finding in itself. And this was, again, done with EEG as, an, as a direct measure of emotional responses. One of the things we also have seen, because we have been testing virtual reality, augmented reality, even before you know Oculus went to Kickstarter. So we have had have a huge database on how customers respond to new technologies such as that, but also 3D printing uh, and, and things like that. So what we have seen is that there is a very particular response that customers have when they are frustrated with new technology. And we also see when they get it. So there's a combination between cognitive load, so when people really have a high cognitive load, that's a typically a, a very bad sign for customer adoption. They tend not to want to buy a product afterwards. But if the motivation is at the same time extremely high, we see that the adoption is actually uh, going to happen because motivation can you know, really become as a buffer to you know, stress, if you like. And of course, there's a learning curve for new technologies. And that is, you know, learning curve does lead to cognitive demand. But if people are really motivated, if they are really you know, interested in this technology and this solution and what it can bring to them, they will actually endure that cognitive load to learn the new technology and that will become actually an even better and more loyal client, if you like. 
If we take a look at uh, neuromarketing overall, uh, there's two different Im uh, trends, if you like, of you know uh, of how neuromarketing is doing currently. On the left side, uh, you can see the number of publications, scientific publications, that are currently happening for neuromarketing, and you can see that in the beginning of the 2000s, you know there were just a very few um, uh, publications per year. So each dot is the number of publications per year. But you can see that already at 2005 and then 2010, we see a huge ramp up in the, the number of publications happening. And already now by 2020, the estimation is that we will have more than 3,000 publications per year just called neuromarketing. There are many other publications that are related to this field, but this is just publications on this concept, on this using this term. So academically, there's a lot of scientific footing and a lot of scientific validation that we see currently. The second, on the right side, is what the expected industrial growth is. And there are several estimations here, and this is pre-corona, unfortunately, so everything has changed after corona, but this is still uh, the expectation, so to speak. And that is the compound aggregate growth rate, which is the CAGR. Um, you know, most industries, they a lot of industries, uh, they have a, an expected growth rate of maybe 4 to 5%. So for new marketing, that industry is expected to have a very strong uh, growth over the coming years. So that means that both academically and commercially, there's a lot of expectations to this, this industry, and it's going to be very interesting to follow as well. So one of the things that we can expect from neuromarketing is that it be, will become a more natural part of uh, market research and customer research in general. So one thing is right now that new marketing might be seen as an extra thing, but I think that over time, and we see this already beginning, is that uh, companies will start using both. So traditional methods, new marketing methods, in conjunction and in combination to provide a whole picture of the customer because we need to understand both the conscious and the subconscious and new marketing should not be treated as a separate thing. Now, the last stage of this presentation, I will start looking into the next steps of neuromarketing. So what are the innovations that we see coming on the horizon or already being here? And uh, I already mentioned a few things. So the equipment that we're using is becoming more affordable. Uh, it's becoming uh, you know, smaller, so it's less intrusive, less difficult for people to wear. And uh, the science also helps because it makes these equipments much more reliable and you know, denoising is a big thing, for example as well and also we're getting much better at uh, understanding the signals from the brain and what they mean in terms of emotional and cognitive responses and how that relates to consumer behaviors but in addition to that we also see a host of new solutions happening online and i think that online is actually one of the biggest changes we'll see in in, in two ways and uh, one thing is using online panel test and of course online panel test has been around for a long time but online panel test using neuroscience that's a novel thing. And one of the things that we, we, we see more and more is that in, in, instead of or in addition to asking people questions about their preferences and things like that, we see that we can also ask about their uh, emotional responses without really asking them questions, more by uh, giving them tasks that reveal their emotional and cognitive responses. So, for example, measuring emotional uh, emotions and feelings can be done through what we call the implicit, uh, implicit association test and also something we call the fast response time test. Um, these are responses that are, you know, when you can, you know, because the, the browser technology and browser coding has been become much more reliable and better and improved, and also computers are becoming much better. And at the same time, also network technology is becoming better. This allows us to have a much more precise understanding and measurement of things such as, um, Re reaction time. Uh, so when people, when you want people to press a button, for example, we have a much more precise uh, understanding and measurement of uh, of that. Uh, this allows us to do a host of tests that have been around from psychology and psychophysics for a long time, and that allows us then again to use those to measure how people respond emotionally. So imagine that you measure how people respond emotionally to a brand. Then you give them an experience, such as an ad or, you know, going through your website or things like that. And then you can measure the brand responses afterwards. A pre-post comparison there could be, you know, is very powerful. 
Another part of uh, the, the, the panel testing is to do testing of associations and thoughts. And as we mentioned earlier uh, today, we can do this as explicit associations. So that would be uh, what people say themselves that, you know, what comes to mind when I, I look at uh, this brand, for example, but also implicit association test. And what you can do here as well is to have people go through a particular experience. Let's say they go through a, uh, the, you know, setting up an account, for example, through your website or an app. And if that is a very difficult experience, you can then measure, you know, how people are responding to, you know, before and after that experience. And do they get other types of associations such as difficult or, you know, bad or things like that? Is that increasing if you ha they have a bad experience? We all can also measure things such as demand and understanding. So do people actually understand the messaging that you try to give them? So are they able to... Um, are they able to understand your messaging? And are they also able to, uh, you know, process that information? And finally, are they actually motivated uh, and making choices? And one thing, of course, through panel testing is that you can ask people questions, but there are ways such as what we call the fast response time test, which is more both what they respond consciously, but also the, the, the response rates. So the, the, the response speed, if you like, is also an indication of subconscious drives, if you like. So if people are in doubt that they will spend more time deliberating, uh, if they're very sure about the responses, they will also tend to respond much faster. So instead of just looking at yes no responses you can also qualify the responses as almost like confidence measures by looking into their uh, response uh, response times the thing we'll talk about here at the end is being able to use the combination of machine learning or AI together with uh, neuroscience data or eye tracking data to predict human behavior. Now, this is a very new field. And what we can see is that when you have an eye tracking database, for example, collecting thousands and thousands and thousands of people, how they are looking at different things. And you combine that with the power of the recent developments in machine learning, you can actually start predicting beha behaviors from people, what people are paying attention to. So this is something we do by looking into what we call neuro neurovision. On this slide, uh, you can see two different versions of the same picture. The top part is where people actually are looking when you have an eye tracking data and from people. This is typically like 30 people that are tested and the heat map represents where people on average are looking. Now, going through those types of data, the machine learning model can actually learn how to, to predict how people will look, uh, where they will look. And the bottom part of each of these pictures is actually the model prediction. And so, as you can see, there are slight nuances, but it's actually the same place at this point. So this means that machine learning combined with very good eye tracking data can start to predict attention. This is critical but it, because it means that now you can have a machine learning model that can work online. You can upload a picture, you can run these analyses and you can get a, protection, uh, a prediction within just a few seconds. And this is exactly what Neurovision is doing. So this is a way that you can use the power of AI or machine learning combined with eye tracking to predict where people are looking and you can rely on those results very nicely. So in this, on the left side, for example, you can do, uh, you can upload a picture, uh, an ad, for example, it, uh, in a, just a few seconds, you will be able to uh, get a heat map and other types of metrics such as cognitive demand and clarity. And then you can look into uh, where people are most likely to pay attention and what they're going to miss. You can also do areas of interest analysis, for example, and this will allow you to get a very good understanding of where people are most likely to pay attention in your visual uh, presentation. It could be a website, it could be an advertising, it could be an app, it could be a lot of different things. It could be a store environment, for example. Now, you can also do this on videos, as you can see on the right side. Uh, and in videos, it will also show you how the cognitive demand and the clarity changes over time. As, you know, is, is the cognitive demand too high? Is the clarity low? And, and things like that. Because that would also give an indication of what people will pay attention to. But one thing you can really think about when it comes to machine learning and AI is that you hear about machine learning and AI happening all the time across all different domains. You have the big uh, companies like Google and Facebook using it, but you also have you know, other institutions, so financial institutions. You see that in retailers. You see them in a lot of different ways that uh, machine learning and, and AI is, is being used. And I think that uh, this is one of the things that we'll definitely see more and more of is the combination of neuroscience and machine learning. One of the reasons for that happening is that uh, machine learning requires 
a ton of data to be able to have a good predictive ac accuracy. And one thing that neuroscience is really good at providing is a lot of data. You can imagine that in an EEG, for example, you get uh, the raw data uh, is actually sampled at at least once, uh, once uh, per millisecond, so a thousand times per second per electrode. Um, for an eye tracking, for example, that might be something like 10, uh, 10 millise uh, milliseconds accuracy. So that means that you have like 100 times per second, you get a new eye tracking data point per eye, for example. So there's a ton of data combined with machine learning can now be used to learn algorithms to predict human behavior. So in total, um, you know, we have four different main insights here. Um, First of all, we can think of neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience as going beyond ad testing. Uh, this means that we're looking into things such as uh, innovation testing, architecture testing, living spaces. We're looking at packaging. We're looking at website design, app design, and much, much more. Every touch point you have you with your client is something you can use neuromarketing to measure and understand and improve. Second is that there's a high growth in neuromarketing and consumer neuroscience, both as we saw in the academic domain, but also in the commercial domain. So this means that this is a technology and that this is a scientific approach that is becoming more and more robust and better as we speak. And it's already you know, way uh, better and more precise than just stated responses, but it's, a, so it's, it's becoming a, a, an absolute necessity for people to start using this technology to be much better at navigating and talking to their, their customers. The third point is that it's moving online. So that means that as we see uh, the future of neuromarketing being embraced these days, we see that there's a lot of online solutions coming up. Uh, that will be online panel testing, for example, but also other types of solutions that bring neuroscience into the fore and into people's home, basically. That, you know, at least some of those technologies that are offered online work very well. I would be careful with, as I mentioned before, uh, automatic facial coding and also webcam eye tracking. Um, Technology needs to be better. Sometimes the science needs to be better as well. But there's a lot of other methods such as implicit association test, fast response test, certain types of memory test and so forth that you can do to measure unconscious responses in people. And finally, the combination of artificial intelligence or machine learning together with very good data set from neuroscience and eye tracking data can be used to make prediction models. And this is, I think, the big new, uh, the biggest kind of innovation within this space is that we see that prediction models become more and more powerful. Yeah. So that's my presentation here. I hope you enjoyed uh, and have learned something uh, along the way here. And I'm very grateful for having this opportunity to present to you. Thank you very much.